Hello, I'm Sebastian Lacido. Thank you for starting this series, Life to Life. My hope is that it brings you peace and understanding about eternity and life after death. The Bible has a lot to say about what happens when you die. While there are emotions and grief after the loss of a loved one, there is also hope. The central message in all of the teachings of Jesus was the message of life after death. In this session, we will talk about what happens when we physically die, how after death our soul and our spirit continue to exist, and as Christians, we have the hope and promise of eternal life. Here is session one. Well, hello, welcome to session one of Life to Life. If you have your Bibles, please open to Ecclesiastes chapter three. It says, uh, verse one, it says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, and so here we see in Ecclesiastes, just like life, the seasons of life, there's good times, there's bad times, we have happy times, we have events in our life that uh, bring us great joy, great happiness, you know, but there's peaks and valleys. And this curriculum uh, is about what happens to us when we pass on, what happens to a believer when they move on to heaven, uh, whether it's us in our own life or the loved ones in our lives. And so. The Bible gives us lots of promises. There's lots of hope for us. Um, don't get me wrong, it's, it's, a, it's a devastating time. It, our emotions swing into gear. There's, there's grief and regret and loss. Uh, but the Bible has a lot to say about this hope that we have. And, and so through this curriculum, we wanna try and bring to the surface the promises and, and what the Bible has to say about life after death. We really uh, don't focus on it as a teaching in the churches today. We, we sort of, uh, deal with it as it comes in our life. Uh, but when you look at it, we spend hours in churches. We go to church, we, we use the church for baptism, for marriage, for weddings, for funerals, uh, for congregating. And all of those hours we spent really point to our eternity and our eternal life. So in this series, we wanna look at, uh, at the hope that we have and trying to understand what the Bible says about eternal life. One of the central messages of Jesus was eternity, was eternal life. When he was talking to Nicodemus, we'll look at it in the teaching, it was all about eternal life. It was all about life after this life. So we named this series, uh, this curriculum, Life to Life, because we go from life here to life there, because no one ever truly dies or ceases to exist. We, we, we pass on here, we die here, but we start a new life in heaven or in, in our eternity. So I wanna take you on a journey today in session one to look at what happens, what actually happens when, when, we, when we physically die. If you go over to Luke chapter 16, uh, there's a story that Jesus tells us. And uh, before I read it, I, I want you to understand that this is not a parable. Uh, in a parable, there's, you know, Jesus has many parables to teach us about the kingdom of, of God and about his kingdom. Uh, where he uses a certain farmer or a certain rich man. Here, there's a, there's a man's name. So this is a story. This is a historical account of something that happened. So in Luke chapter 16 and verse 19, it says there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me Send Lazarus that he may dip the tips of his fingers in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Let's just stop there for a second. Let's just take a look at what we read. So the Bible tells us that there's two men. One is a rich man. His identity is protected. We don't know his name. We don't know who he is. But he, the Bible says that he had a pretty good life here on earth. And there was a beggar. Uh, the Bible calls him a beggar named Lazarus who happened to sit at this rich man's gate, the entry into his property, 
and he was you know, essentially living off the garbage from his home. So the Bible gives us a, a great contrast of two individuals, one who had it really well here on earth and one who had lots of issues here on earth. The Bible tells us that both of these men physically died. So here on earth, both of them had a funeral. The rich man probably had, you know, a lot of pomp and circumstance. He probably had a lot of speakers. There were, you know, whatever the custom of the day is today, there'd be lots of flowers, there'd be many that would attend the wake in, in the service. And the poor man probably had, you know, a state paid funeral. And so while the funeral is going on here on earth, we see that Jesus tells us that both of these men continue to exist. One was carried by the angels to a place called Abraham's bosom. Um, and this is uh, in, in the Bible today's session, we're gonna see that this is a place called paradise. This is where the Old Testament saints would go after they pass. Jesus is alive here on earth. In the New Testament, after his resurrection and his ascension, we, we go directly to heaven. But before that, their sins were not taken care of. And because of that, they went to this place called Abraham's bosom. The rich man went to a place called torment. So he's in this place called torment. So essentially, when you look at the story here, there's two different compartments. One is called paradise or Abraham's bosom. One is, one is called torment. And the, the interesting thing is they can both see each other in this place. So with these two compartments, the rich man seen Lazarus and asked him if he could give him some relief from the torment that he was in. And, and so we see that both of them are existence. Now try to, try to get the, the story in your mind that on earth here, both of them had funerals. Their families were weeping for them. There was grief, there was despair, and uh, what would be typical at a funeral, the emotions that would go in a funeral. But here we see that they continued on. And so we wanna continue in, and look at this. Abraham a answers him in verse 25, it says, but Abraham said, son, remember in your lifetime, you receive good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who would want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if one of them goes from the dead, they will repent. And he said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one who rises from the dead. So, you know, the, the story continues here. There's lots of revelation here about our subject matter. I mean, one of, the, one of the things is that we retain our memory, right? We retain the look. So when we die, when we physically die here, our soul and our spirit separate from our body. So Lazarus' lifeless body and the rich man's lifeless body were here on earth at their funerals. But their soul, which is their mind, their will, their intellect, their memory, and their spirit, which is the real us, you'll see in today's uh, uh, curriculum, uh, go on to heaven or to hell in this case. So we see that life continues. They go from life here to life there. The other thing is, that the, the rich man uh, remembered who he left behind and he tried to intercede for them. He's saying, Abraham, I left five brothers on earth. Send someone from here to go talk to them so they don't come into this place of torment. He was negotiating for those he left on earth. It was a, is a type of prayer. And Abraham said, there's no way to change your eternity. Once your heart stops, your eternity is set. And so he said, you can't pass from one to the other. And so we, we see that, that life continues for both of these uh, individuals after their funerals, after their funerals here on earth. And so does it for our family members, you know. And so while it's, you know, it's okay to mourn and it's, it's, it's very natural to have grief, but behind the grief and behind the mourning and behind the regret and the other emotions that we feel after physical death, we have to understand that that person has an eternity, just like we have an eternity. And so let's like even take a little bit of a, 
of a deeper dive into it. Uh, go with me, if you would, over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's look at what the Bible has to say about our bodies. In uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, For we know that if our earthly house, that's our body, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in heaven. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up in life. And essentially just breaking that down, our bodies are getting older, our bodies are breaking down as we get older and older in this life to be clothed with mortality or, or, or immortality. Verse five, it says, now he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. That's the Holy Spirit as a down payment. So we are always confident that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So here he says, while we are at home in the body, so there's a place in this physical body where we're at home, we're absent from the presence of the Lord, but it goes on to say, we're confident, yes, well pleased to be absent from the body, so we can be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord, which is in heaven. And so here we see that the real us, the real, uh, the real surviving us, the real us eternally is not this body. This body is a temporary vessel. And I want you to picture if you would imagine a glove. When you put a glove on your hand, the glove has life because the, your hand is in the glove, right? It's the same thing with our body. When you take the glove off, the glove has no structure. It has no life. Our hand, our soul, our spirit is our real life. And so we need to understand that. We want to look at the creation of man, but the Bible makes it clear here, and I'll read it one more time. It says, for we are always confident knowing that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him, to God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to that was, which was done, whether good or bad. Amen. And so we see here, again, if we go back to uh, Luke chapter 16, you know, we see that, that Lazarus and the rich man were at home in the body. They left the body. Their soul and their spirit departed from their bodies their lifeless bodies were buried in tombs uh, and graves, but their soul and their spirit continued on. And that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is, is trying to illuminate to us. I think to really understand our lives as three parts, I think we have to go back to the beginning uh, to our creation and see, you know, how God created us, how he built us, and how the three parts uh, correspond with one another. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at the, the physical creation uh, of man and woman. Um, chapter 1 and verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. And I want you to notice, God said, Let us, plural, we see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. Let us make man in our image to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created he them. God is not body. God doesn't have a physical body. God is a living spirit. So when we look at the word image here, he's, he's talking about a living spirit. So he said, God said, let us make man in our image. So God created his spirit, the spirit of man and woman here. The word in verse 27 is, is the word bara, which means to create something from nothing. So he, cre he didn't have a material, 
He created their spirits with no existing material. And so he created man in his own image, but also in his likeness, which means God, we're made in God's likeness. When you see God, he's going to have two hands, two arms, two eyes, two ears, and we see that through Scripture. So God created first the spirit of man. If you go to chapter 2 and verse 7, it says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul or a living uh, man. So when you look at this, God used materials. He used the earth. So we see the three parts of man. First was his spirit, then his body, and then his soul. And he became a living being at that point. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. Then the Lord God took man, put him in the Garden of Eden to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. In the original language, it actually says two deaths. You'll experience the first death and you'll experience the second death. So God commands the man. He, he, Eve is not created at this point. So he's in this perfect environment. He puts man in the garden. He gives him one command. You can eat. You can, everything in this garden is yours. You can have dominion over it. But of this one tree, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat of this tree. This is the command. If you do, there's a consequence to your actions. In dying, you'll die. Or by the first death, you'll experience the second death. And so then God goes on and he creates Eve. In fact, Eve is not created at this point. Uh, we might as well read that. Lord God said, it's not good for man that he should be alone. I will make him a helper uh, comparable to him. So out of the ground, God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Whatever Adam called them, each living creature, that was its name. God gave names, to all, Adam gave names to all of the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. The Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took his rib and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man he made into a woman. He brought her to man. Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Shall be, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And so we see the interesting thing in uh, chapter 1 of verse 26. Uh, God said, let us make man in our image. But he created male and female spiritually at the same time. Uh, and what happened was they were all both in Adam. When God caused Adam to go into a deep sleep, he took Eve out, so the two fractions now, they were both fractions. They came together and they became one through marriage, through the union of marriage. But we see the spirit, soul, and body of both of them. In chapter 3, uh, we're, we'll now look at the fall of man, which really is why we have these emotions and why we have uh, all of the issues that we're facing today. In chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So the serpent comes in and comes to Eve and says, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So he asks a question. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruits of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst or the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it nor shall you touch, at least you die. So here, Adam, Eve wasn't created at the time. So Adam told Eve, we, sh we can't eat of this tree and don't even touch it because there's consequences to it. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. In other words, he's telling her, there is no consequence to your actions. There's no consequence to your sin. For God knows in the day that you eat, your eyes will be open. You shall be like God, knowing good and evil. So Satan's, you know, just a little side teaching here. Satan's agenda here was to get them to disobey God. And so his, his immediate attack was to tell Eve that there's no consequence to your disobedience. There's no consequence to your sin coming directly against the word of God. And, uh, and he goes on to say that if you do eat, 
you'll be like God knowing good and evil. Essentially what he's saying is you'll be like God determining for yourself what's good and evil. So the Bible goes on to say, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eye, a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband and he ate. And the both of their eyes were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together. They made themselves coverings. So we see here that when Eve partook of the fruit, she ate, nothing happened. When she gave to her husband, when she gave to Adam, he ate. The Bible says that the eyes of them both were open. So there was a change. There was a, there was a physical uh, uh, ch change in them and they knew something. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together. They made themselves apron. So evidently within the environment, after they sinned automatically, we don't see God coming in and saying, now you sin. We see that their sin triggered the response that God said would happen in that at that point, they spiritually died. They were, they were disconnected from God. The Bible tells us, and you're going to know this word over these next sessions, they became unrighteous in the eyes of God. They, become, they, they were not in good standing with God. They were spiritually alive to God. Now they were spiritually dead to God. As a result of it, they were judged. And as a result of it, their physical environment changed. What they had seen before in the environment that they were in had drastically changed to a point where they realized they were naked and in shame. So they were clothed with something prior that was gone. So their physical environment changed. And so they tried to cover their shame. They tried to cover their sin. They tried to cover themselves. They sewed fig leaves together. You know what happens to leaves in 24 or 48 hours. It doesn't last. And uh, they, the Bible says that they heard a sound of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, from among the trees of the garden. So I want you to, to, to see this. So their God that created them, that they serve, after this fall, they tried to run and hide from them. Their shame, the change in their environment, their spiritual death caused them to try and hide themselves from the very God that created them. And we see God respond. And then the Lord God, verse nine, called to them and said, Adam, he said to him, where are you? He actually said, why are you where you are? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived and I ate. So I want to, I want to stop here because this is, this is extremely important to understand that when they sinned, when they disobeyed, immediately a judgment occurred. They died spiritually. And as a result of it, we see every negative emotions that we fight with today, low self-esteem, fear, depression, grief, regret, shame. So all of the things that we fight with today are a result of spiritual death first, being separated from God, from that perfect environment. And then our souls died. Our mind, our will, our intellect was disconnected from God. And we began to have negative emotions. We began to, we began to be in fear. We began to be depressed. We began to change in our thinking because we were now separated from God. And so because of the first death, uh, which was spiritual, this disconnection from God, we became unrighteous. Our souls then died and eventually our, our, our bodies will die. In fact, if you go over to Genesis chapter five and uh, verse one, it says, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam and the day God created man he made him in the likeness of God. Notice he doesn't say the image of God. Again, verse one, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. In other words, we look like God. 
He created a male and female. He blessed them, called their name mankind or Adam in the day that they were created. Adam lived 100 years and 30 years and begot a son in his own likeness. And now after his image, which is now spiritual death, Adam name, gave his name to his son, Seth. And so we see here that from Adam, everyone born of Adam is not only born in the likeness of Adam, which is in the likeness of God, but is also born in the image of Adam, spiritually dead, unrighteous, disconnected from God. And this starts uh, humanity's journey down this road of needing salvation, of needing eternal life. So from this point, when any person died that, that, that believed in God or had faith in the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, as we get into the Old Testament, they couldn't go to heaven because they were still unrighteous. They went to this place called paradise in the belly of the earth. And, uh, and those that didn't went into this place called torment, which is in the belly of the earth. And so this sort of started this journey for man. Uh, let's look at the, at the terminology in it. Uh, go with me to Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. It says, therefore, just as through one man, and that man is Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men for all sin. So just let's go back through it slowly. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin and death spread to all men because all sin. So any of the offspring of Adam, any of the offspring of man were born sinners. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned. And when I say death, I mean spiritual death, soulish death, and physical death. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. This is talking about Jesus. Adam and Jesus are going to be compared now and contrast through the next six verses. They're, the reason they are is Adam had no physical father and uh, uh, Jesus had no physical father, right? God was their father. In fact, you'll learn in the series, that's why Jesus was born outside of Adam's transgression because sin traveled through the male seed. So any seed from Adam would be born unrighteous, condemned, and would need salvation. Jesus was born outside of Adam's transgression because he was born of a virgin. And so he, was, he, wa he wasn't a part of Adam's transgression. He was born righteous to God and became unrighteous, as you'll see later in the curriculum. So now we go through a, a couple of verses. It says, but the free, verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's, and I'll use the name here, by one man's offense, by Adam's offense, many died. Moreover, by the grace, and grace is a gift of God, the gift of grace of one man, Jesus Christ, will abound to many. And the gift is not like that which comes through one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense, that's Adam, resulted in condemnation, but the free gift came from many offenses resulting in justification. For if by one man's offense or Adam's offense, death reigned through one, much more those who receive abundance of grace, and grace is a gift from God, you'll see that in our series, the gift of righteousness will reign through one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, through one man's offense, through Adam's offense, judgment came to all men, circle all in your Bible, resulting in condemnation, even through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all as a result of justification by one man's life. And so he goes back and forth through the process, really showing us the difference in, uh, in righteousness and unrighteousness 
we begin to see, we begin to understand that man is born with a condition that needs to be resolved, and that caused death. Man, was, man is born needing salvation. It's not, it's not a matter of how good you are or how bad you are on earth. I mean, those, that plays into it. But every single man, no matter where you are, no matter you know, what covering you are, no matter what roof you're born under, no matter what Christian denomination you're born under, we are all born condemned. We are all born needing salvation. We're all born needing a savior. And that's why we begin to understand the bigger picture. We understand how Jesus could say, turn the other cheek. We understand how he prayed for his executioners. We understand uh, that we're eternal and there's something beyond this life. So Jesus beginning to teach them uh, in John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17, Jesus is at the end of his days here. And so this is some of the rich teaching. But in John chapter 14, uh, in verse 1, it says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Uh, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. Listen to what he's telling them. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you will be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know. Where are you going and how can we know the way? So Jesus tells them, listen, part of my mission here is to make a place for you. And I've come here to uh, prepare a place for you so that where I am, you'll be also. This is, this is a part of his process. Thomas said, you know, where are you going? Show us the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Very important words in scripture, because, you know, there's 7 billion people on the face of the earth, and there's about a billion of, you know, or a little over a billion Christians. And so Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to heaven. No one goes to the Father except through me. So no, no one has life except through Jesus. Christianity is the way to heaven. Verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And now, from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it's sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, I, have I been so long with you yet? Have you not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father's in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me. He does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do also will he do, and greater works will he do because I go to, to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And so Jesus, in this very rich teaching about part of his mission here on earth before he leaves, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Those that believe in me will, will, will go to this place called heaven, and, and I'm making it so that you here on earth that believe in me will do the same works that I'm doing. You'll go out and make converts as I am doing, so that they can come to this beautiful place called heaven with us. There is a whole eternity on the other side of physical death. And as we go through the sessions, I pray that you would, it would speak into your heart, it would speak into your minds, that you would glean the revelation in the scriptures. You know, so what did we, what did we learn today? We really learned that man is a three-part being, that we're a spirit primarily and a soul, and we're temporarily in a body that physical death is really separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. The body becomes lifeless, but our life continues in our soul and in our spirit. That we are born unrighteous and that we need salvation. So us, I'm, I'm assuming that 
those of you watching this are Christians. So us that are Christians, we have moved from unrighteousness to righteousness or right standing with God. We'll see that in the rest of the curriculum. And Jesus came to give us an eternity, to give us a place in heaven eternally with him. And so that's part of his mission. In our next uh, uh, sessions in this curriculum, we'll look at the mechanics of that and how Jesus did that for us and how we can know that we know that we know that we're gonna go to heaven. So God bless you and thank you for watching session one. Thank you for watching. I pray your relationship with the Lord is growing deeper and stronger each day and your grief is short and joy comes quickly. In this curriculum, I wanna encourage you to check out other resources and curriculums the ministry has available at watchersoftruth.com. That's watchersoftruth.com.